can't see all of the gang signs we used to see. You can't see all of the designer jewellery, the fresh haircuts, the brand new designer clothes. You can't see any of that no more because that was what was winding the public up. So the Home Office, they decided to just hide it all rather than deal with the problem. This is Callum Smiles for Rebel News and I've come down to Dover to get an update on the migrant situation. The port you can see behind me is the well-known port where most of the migrant arrivals first land in the United Kingdom. Fortunately, I was able to catch up with and get an interview with local journalist Steve Laws. Here's the interview. So I'm joined here now with Steve Laws, a man many would consider an expert on illegal immigration. Steve, just how big a problem is this in the United Kingdom? It's an absolutely massive problem. The numbers are climbing out of control. This year alone, we've had over 40,000 by boat that we know about. 10,000 of those have been from Albania. And it's just climbing out of control. Is Dover the only place they land? No, Dover's not the only place they arrive. For instance, they land in Dungeness or various beach landings all along the Kent coast. Some have even been reported to land in the Isle of Wight. And you mentioned it's getting more difficult for journalists or just everyday people to actually go and see this for themselves. Why is that and just how difficult are they making it? Well, at first, they, they basically what they've done is they've changed the gangway, so ultimately we have to stand on the cliffs to be able to film that. And because the cliffs it has low visibility and you can't really see what's going on down there, it's ultimately hiding it from the public eye. If you go down actually at the facilities, it's behind eight-foot fences, so you can't really see anything going on in the facility. It's all done to keep it away from the public eye because they don't want the pictures of young fighting age men coming over to the country. They don't want people to see these images, so the best way to do it is to hide it. You mentioned young fighting age men coming into the country. Is that, you know, from your own experience, you've done this for a number of years now. How many women and children have you seen? Well, from my experience, it's 90% young fighting age men and then about 5% elderly men and then the rest are women and children. So only about 5% of the arrivals are women and children that I've seen with my own eyes. How many of these would you say are actual refugees? Because there's many reports out there about how you know, a lot people pay a lot of money for these crossings. How many from what you know would you say are actual refugees? None of these people are actually refugees. They've all passed through safe countries. They've came from safe France for one. So ultimately if they were asylum seekers they should be claiming asylum in France, not the UK. So to suggest making the crossing and going across the channel in a dinghy is unnecessary when they can already do it in France. So these are not genuine refugees, they're economic migrants and they're here for financial benefits or other reasons. So in terms of when these people come over to the UK, they need housing and, you know, we give them accommodation. We were talking earlier about Napier Barracks, one of the previous what, processing centres. But now they've gone into a place called Manston. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about Napier and Manston and the similarities between the two? So Napier Barracks is uh, in Shorncliffe in Folkestone, which is an ex-military barracks which is now being used to house illegal immigrants. And it's the facility that most will have known where they burned down the barracks. Most people will have seen the image where it happens. So ultimately, at the moment, currently, there's around three to 400 illegal immigrants that are staying there, give or take. And the similarities with Manston is ultimately Manston's designed to be the same sort of facility, which is just by the Manston Airport, for those that don't know. And it's basically designed to be a processing facility and a stopgap before the before they get moved on to hotels or other accommodation. But the similarities in the problems are the NGOs have started rallying up and they've come behind the Manston facility and now they're now claiming it's a concentration camp. And the problem is they're now trying to push for these people to be moved out of the camp and into homes. They don't want them into hotels, they don't want them into B&Bs, they want them put into their own homes and that's what they're pushing for. And it was the same situation down at Napier Barracks which ultimately encouraged them to cause trouble, then violence, then a fire. At the moment at Manston there's trouble, the illegal immigrants are fighting with themselves and with staff, there's been drugs found on the facility, there's been weapons found on the facility and the problem seems to be escalating. And, and it seems like it's playing out exactly how it happened with Napier Barracks and at the moment they're at the concentration camp stage which next it will be going through the courts and legal procedures to take the government to court saying it's unsafe for these people and it's playing out exactly the same that happened two years ago. So what sort of financial implications does this have on the UK taxpayer? 
Of course, this is costing the taxpayer millions of pounds. They all hear about the six to seven million pounds a day cost for the hotels, but no one ever hears how much it costs to house people in the barracks or to keep them in processing facilities like Manston. With silly little expenses, like they've spent nine thousand pounds, according to one of my Manston sources, just on Xboxes alone to keep the illegal immigrants happy because they've got nothing to keep them entertained on the facility. They spend thousands and thousands of pounds every week on interpreters, on people to help them process their asylum claims, on GPs going into the facility as well as nurses. All of these expenses all come from the taxpayer's purse, but none of them get mentioned in the media. It's always focusing on the story of, oh, we're spending seven million pounds on hotels, but we're also probably spending millions of pounds a day on all these multiple facilities around the country. How much are they spending on things like food? Because there was outrage about how the taxpayer was buying pizzas for these asylum seekers. So last year, I'd done a freedom of information request to get the exact figure of how much it costs for the uh, the border force to feed the illegal immigrants upon arrival and they spent 358,000 on Domino's pizzas and kebabs for illegals when they arrived so they was giving them takeaways as soon as they arrived once that story reached the mainstream media and it was pushed out amongst normal people and they realized what was going on the home office changed that and put in a new private uh, catering firm down at the new multi-million pound facility behind us and on in that catering firm it cost the taxpayer £1.7 million just between January and September this year to feed illegal immigrants at the new Dover facility as well as Manston. What sort of things are the likes of the UK politicians and senior public officials doing about this? Because you know we, we, get, we keep hearing the same rhetoric, you're going to do X and Y and Z and then it never happens and someone new comes in. What's the sort of thing they're doing now? Nothing. <laughs> That's the bottom line of it, unfortunately. No matter whenever we change the Home Secretary, we go from Javid to Patel to Braverman, they all start out with a hard line approach. They all say, we're going to stop the boats, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But ultimately, it's the, same, it's the same narrative every single time, no matter the Home Secretary. It's almost like they're repeating the same scripts every two years. Talk me through the process about how when they leave France, because obviously, you know, in France, it's a French issue. Once they leave French waters, it's now a British issue. Talk me through that process. So, so from leaving a dinghy in northern France, ultimately what they do is they're, they're, the traffickers will rally all the, the people that are going to go into the dinghy. They carry the dinghy down the beach. They hop out to sea. And then once they get a mile from the coast, the French Coast Guard will escort them to the middle of the channel. And when I say escort, it's more shadow them about... I don't know, about 30 to 100 metres behind them. And then once they get into UK waters, they phone through to the border force or the coast guard on the UK side and they say there's a boat there. If, they, if the French coast guard on a rare incident doesn't find the dinghy and they come over on their own, usually the illegal immigrants will phone through themselves because there's, there's a call centre that they can phone to get help and say that they're stuck out at sea in the RNLI or the border force will rush out to get them. And then from there, the border force and the RNLI will bring them back to the UK, unload them down at Dover, put them onto coaches, send them to Manston, at Manston, they would take biometric data and get as much information as they can as possible before sending them onto hotels after being processed in their asylum claims. And then from hotels, they're in hotels from anything from six months to two years. And then from there, they're going to social housing in private, private, uh, private housing stock that's come under the banner of companies like Serco or Clear Springs Ready Homes. With things like the crossing, so you see many people that protest the protest those that don't want to just take in anyone into our country. They all say that they're really hard done by, they are fleeing persecution and war, but actually there's many reports talking about these people paying like big sums of money basically for a, a ticket on one of these boats. What sort of figures do they pay? Well, they can pay anything from what went from speaking in my own experiences to the illegals I've spoken to. Many of them have paid anything from 1,500 euros all the way up to 6,000 euros. And the prices vary on the quality of the dinghy that they're coming over. For instance, if you want a high quality dinghy that's not likely to sink in the water, etc., they're going to spend more three, four thousand pounds. But if they could just want a seat in any old dinghy and it's the summer and they used to have like summer sales on TikTok, etc. So from there, they could pay anything from 500 euros to 1500 but the average is around 1500 to 3000 euros these days why do we struggle to know who these people are like we, we hear in the news that, that these people come over with no documentation how is that allowed and and you know it, it seems like a common theme is there a reason they don't have documentation 
well, a lot of them throw their documentation away before they even arrive, reach to the UK. There's numerous videos of illegal immigrants throwing their passports when they're in a dinghy so they don't have to explain who they are. What the reasons that for, that could vary in all sorts of reasons. They could have committed a crime at home, they could have escaped prison, they could just not want people to know where they are. There's various different reasons. Are you scared? You have no, I'm not scared. No? How long have you been in France? We are seven years in France. Seven years? Five years prison. But ultimately we couldn't, we can't never really know who these people are because when they arrive with no sort of data or any sort of passport or anything like that, we, we're never going to know the true extent. So they could say to us, hi, my name's John. We've just got to assume that their name's John and hope for the best, unfortunately. That's the policies we have in place. Unfortunately in the UK, a lot of people don't really seem to care about this issue because it doesn't seem to affect them. From what you know, many of us have seen is that they don't just land here and they get housed here. Whereabouts in the UK do these people go? Well, here's the thing. It does affect every single person in the country because, unfortunately, it doesn't matter if it's a small village like in Linton or News with around 500 people or a major city like London or Birmingham, the illegal immigrants are being housed in hotels there and then ultimately given the social housing stock or the private rental stock from those areas and being dispatched. They're sort of being spread around the whole of the, the country rather than in just one strict area. So it doesn't seem like such a huge problem. So if they scatter a few in one town and a few in another town, ultimately every town's receiving illegal immigrants now, whether they realise it or not. What sort of reaction do you get from the Border Force, other, other news companies, politicians, when you are doing what you know, you'd call citizen journalism? You are just trying to find out a story, tell people the facts about exactly what's going on. What sort of reaction do you get from these people down here? When I first started covering it, it was a really hostile reaction from the border force. I think it was due to they wasn't used to being filmed, they wasn't used to press being around them, and then all of a sudden it became a massive story and their job was in the media eye every day. So I used to get a bit of a hostile environment from the border force. These days it's not too bad, they say hello to me and things like that. The media speak to me and things like that, but... Going back a year or so ago, I was some far-right anti-migrant hunter, but now the media reach out to me and ask for information, ask for advice and so on. So there, it's positive now, but it never used to be. So Steve, you've been in Dover that long. You're basically a resident now. So I imagine you kind of understand what the people of Dover think. What are the things they're saying about all this? Well, a lot of the people are angry at this thing because nothing's being done about it. And there's also people that are scared. Take the family that was living in Acliffe, for instance. A beach landing happens not far from here. They legged it up into the village. And then one illegal immigrant was found in the woman's home downstairs. And she had to call the police because he demanded to use her phone to go to a different location. And obviously... Around Dover, it's the main talking point. They see it every day. They're absolutely concerned. They're frustrated at the subject. Then it has knock-on effects as well because it's now affecting children's school places because the children that have arrived illegally are now being given school places in front of the people that actually live in the area. Take Canterbury and Ashford, for instance. And now year seven and nine students there, there's no places for anyone in the area because they've all been taken up by asylum-seeking children. So it has a continuous effect and it... The residents have all had enough, if I'm honest with you. So we used to see a constant stream of videos and pictures. It was almost like there was a live stream of everything that's going on in Dover. Why is that not the case now? And could you show us? Yeah, sure. Well, the reason it's not there's not a constant flow of pictures and videos now is because they've moved the facility and the gangway's been moved out of sight and unless you've got a really expensive camera that even most of the press photographers come down have you can't see clear images especially when there's a haze or there's mist or there's a foggy weather you're not going to see it from the cliffs it's too far away so it's hidden out of sight from the public but I'm happy to show you down there if you want. So here we are in the port of Dover. Steve what is significant about where we are right now? So where we are right now is where tens of thousands of illegal immigrants have been unloaded by the border force. They've been walked up the gangway behind you before being loaded onto coaches. Of course, they don't use this gangway now because they've moved them to the new one around the corner. So now you can't see any arrivals. So we are like literally right by the gangway. Like You could see clear as day the people coming up. As one of the first people here, how close could you get to them? You could literally stand as far as you and I are before 
from each other at the top of the gangway. It's where we used to be able to get the photos of illegal immigrants swearing or having gun tattoos on their hands or various other sort of throwing up gang signs, etc. All of these images is what we could get whilst we was here. But of course now they're not unloaded here. We can't see any of this. The public can't really see the true scale or what type of people are actually coming over. And how common was it that you'd see people with, you know, gun tattoos on them, negative, rude reactions from, how common was that? At least one in every boat. So say a border force vessel arrives with 30 to 50 on board, when they unload at least one or two of those people would be abusive towards the photographers. And how did the border force take to you being here and, you know, public officials, how did they feel about the fact that you could literally be a handshake way from all these people coming into our country illegally? All they asked at the time was that we don't get in the way or interfere with their operations. So as long as we didn't stand in the way and disturb them from doing their job, they didn't really care. They wasn't happy about it, but of course they couldn't stop it because we're doing what was within the law. And clearly, obviously, you didn't listen to their requests. You didn't go away. So they went away themselves. As you know, you can see today, there's no one coming up here. They don't even actually use this place anymore. Could you show us where they now use? Yeah, sure thing. It's just around the corner. I'll show you. So, Steve, we've only come about 200 metres because we were originally just over there. And now behind us, they have this brand new facility that doesn't look cheap. What's, what's new? What's changed? Well, ultimately, this facility behind you has been reported to cost £2 million to the taxpayer. And it's designed to hide the arrivals and keep everything out of sight of the public. Before, you'd be able to see where we was a second ago, unloading up the gangway. You'd also be able to see the illegal immigrants being processed in the facilities that was at the top of the gangway. But since they've moved all of that, it's now hidden from the public. You can't really see anything. It's behind 10 to 12 foot black fences, just completely hidden. And is this the case for everyone, you know, so at that, the original place over there, independent journalists, mainstream media, anyone off the street could see exactly what was going on. Is this now the case for everyone that this is completely cut off to the country? Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you're an independent journalist or you work for the likes of the BBC or even uh, various charities like Care for Cali, nobody can get into the facility now, nobody can see what's going on and it's designed just to stop people from seeing the true reality of the situation and how much expense is going into it. For instance, this time last year, we'd be able to go to the processing facility and we'd see them getting deliveries such as Domino's Pizza, etc. All of that's hidden now. You can't see what's going on behind those fences. So we don't really know the true scale no more. Can we see them once they've come ashore or are they even processed and put onto buses behind those fences? The whole thing happens behind. So for instance, they're unload at the gangway, they walk them up, they take them into the various huts that they've got behind the fences and then from there they will load them onto coaches and drive them straight to Manston. From there they will get processed, they'll find out what details they can about them and then within 24 to 48 hours in normal circumstances they'll be moved to a hotel. So how has this changed for everyone? Like, what, what can we do about you know, literally keeping an eye on our own shores. Unfortunately, the only place you can get a true scale of what's going on is from the top of the cliffs. But most camera equipment, and depending on the various weather, etc., it doesn't really make it possible to get a clear picture. Of course, you can still see the boats roughly, and you can see them sort of going up the gangway. But you can't get a close-up image to see what type of people are coming over. You can't see all of the gang signs we used to see. You can't see all of the designer jewellery, the fresh haircuts, the brand new designer clothes. You can't see any of that no more, because that was what was winding the public up. So the Home Office, they decided to just hide it all rather than deal with the problem. And do you know what, would be the implication, what the implications would be if I was to go in there? You'd most likely get arrested. But I don't know, to be honest with you. I'm assuming you wouldn't even be able to get in there to even try and get in there because it's all, it's all locked. They would have to open the gate from the outside with the keys to let you in. So ultimately, you wouldn't be able to get in there even if you tried. And this place is manned 24-7? Oh yeah, it's manned by security 24-7, all at a taxpayer's expense. So Steve, one of the biggest concerns to the UK taxpayer is just how much an operation like this costs. What sort of figures do you know of? Well, what I do know is it costs roughly £2.5 million just to build the facility behind us. It costs £1.7 million between January and September this year to feed the people in the facility under the new catering contract. It costs over £800,000 in fuel this year for illegal immigrants to be picked up by border force vessels, as well as the fact that the Home Office are purchasing new border force vessels, such as the four new ex-wind farm vessels that are used, because they have a larger capacity to bring in more people. 
and ultimately it's costing millions and millions of pounds every day because loads of money is being spent on home office personnel arriving to do asylum applications and check out the facility. You've got catering staff, you've got security staff, you've got coach drivers and various other staff throughout the facility such as cleaners and delivery drivers. It's costing a huge amount of money and the home, the home office refused to give the true figure because they don't want the public to know it. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us today and showing us just exactly what's going on down here in Dover. If you're interested in this ongoing story, and judging by those figures, for a long time it will be an ongoing story, head over to migrantreports.co.uk to keep up to date with everything we'll be doing here in Dover. Thank you. If you value the work we do on the migrant crisis and you want to help out, please, head over to migrantreports.co.uk to help cover the expenses so we can keep bringing you these great stories and keep you informed of a very important matter. Thank you.